Welcome to the Vision by Protivity podcast. I'm Joe Kornick, Editor-in-Chief of Vision by Protivity, our global content resource examining big themes that will impact the C-suite and executive boardrooms worldwide. Today, we're exploring the future of money, and who better than Swarup Gupta, Lead Industry Analyst for Financial Services at the Economist Intelligence Unit, the research arm of The Economist, to help us explore that topic. Gupta is an expert on digital finance, including central bank digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, as well as issues of privacy and data protection. Certainly sounds like we have a lot to talk about. So Swarup, I appreciate you joining us today. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about the future of money and specifically the rise of sort of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, whether that be Bitcoin or other currencies from the private sector or the central banks. Um, What's your view of where digital currencies go over the next three to five or even 10 years? And and what are the potential impacts of that evolution? Right. So uh, even now across, you know, the greatest part of the planet, cash is definitely it remains king and it continues to be the major mode of payment. But there are various estimates that show that, uh, you know, as a mode of payment, cash could decline to as low as 5 percent by 2030 to 2031. So, uh, you know, digitalization is something that is definitely picking up and uh, that is likely to continue over the rest of this decade and then even further. Uh, And it's quite likely that, you know, some form of digital payments will emerge at different parts of the world. It could, you know, take up different forms uh, across uh, the planet. So for example, real-time payments, uh, very fast digital payments are a reality across several countries and Southeast Asia, many of whom have also simultaneously or, you know, prior to this rolled out digital identity services, Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the private sector might actually take up a major role in the developed countries, as we can see, Uh, you know, first, for example, in the US with Venmo, and now with the progress and the unceasing march of Apple Pay. So, you know, digital payments are definitely going to take center stage, the use of cash is going to fall, and, you whether that that's going to take several forms that's going to be real-time payment systems uh instant payment systems both private and public uh, a small amount of cryptocurrencies and ultimately uh you know central bank digital currencies which i'm sure you'll come to in a bit right that's kind of where i was going next right as digital currencies become more mainstream and as you point out i think we're, we're all in agreement that it's heading that way um what do you sort of view as the role of, of governments or international bodies in regulating those currencies and and who takes the lead on on such an effort and what does that potentially mean for the u.s dollar uh, and assuming it has a diminished role in the future what could potentially replace the u.s dollar well let me start with the fate of the u.s dollar uh i'm afraid uh, for you know naysayers of the u.s dollar that isn't happening anytime soon. So lots of statistics show that almost 90% of cross-border transactions in Southeast Asia, definitely one of the fastest growing parts of the planet, is conducted using the US dollar, uh, whether as an you know, initial form of conversion or as a last mile channel in which you convert different currencies across the region. So yes, the US dollar's share of foreign trade is likely to decline over time, perhaps over the next decade, but that's not happening anytime soon. At the same time, you know, the US government itself has shown, especially through the actions of the SEC, that it wants to take back the use of money as a sovereign tool of governance and policymaking. Uh, The way it's gone after uh, crypto exchanges, in particular those which have refused to register, uh, shows that the government is government, the US government, and in fact, governments across the world are keen to, you know, reassert their sovereignty over money as a form of exchange of value. So definitely governments will take an increasingly important role, uh, you know, uh, whether it's through uh, government-backed real-time payment systems like the U.S. is fed now or multi-CBDCs or CBDCs themselves. Coming to CBDCs, uh, you know, there, there are various benefits to the promotion and introduction of a CBDC. It encourages innovation in many spheres, enhances efficiency and reduces costs for internal as well as external economies in terms of foreign exchange transactions and also promotes greater financial inclusion, not just in the developing world, but surprise, surprise, also in developed countries where large amounts of cash dominate population. So by here by financial inclusion, I'm not 
referring only to a poverty element, but also access to financial services of multiple kinds, for example, debit and credit services and insurance. So it's going to be a very gated uh, development of central bank digital currencies, uh, you know, uh, across the world. Uh, several initiatives have actually taken off. For example, uh, you know, China, Hong Kong, Japan, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE have experimented not just with retail CBDCs, but also with wholesale CBDCs. Uh, so, you know, CBDC development is proceeding uh, along two forks. One is retail and the other is wholesale. While a lot of attention of both policymakers and analysts and the press is devoted to retail CBDCs, what is likely to take off initially is wholesale CBDCs. And, you know, that is related to another issue we'll, we'll probably come to later in the conversation, which I will try and end with you know, this particular section. So wholesale CBDCs are concerned more with interbank payments and essentially are trying to replace or reset the financial infrastructure of a country as it exists in a pre-digitalization format. Uh, basically, if countries can digitalize a large part of their financial transactions uh, within a country, it improves transaction, it improves efficiencies, reduces transaction costs, and essentially shortens the chain which is required when a currency is converted into another currency. Uh, this, has, this itself has taken several forms. The most common form, uh, you know, is using a single token, which is uh, issued jointly by multiple commercial banks across countries. So, you know, the UA and Saudi Arabia have been uh, working on a similar project where, a, where the same token is issued by multiple banks. The other form that it has taken slightly allied is known as a multi-CBDC format, where CBDCs of different countries, different CBDCs are interoperable and operate with the similar financial infrastructure and rules governing them. Uh, the retail CBDC, which has seen the most research, has only taken off in China. And even there, it hasn't been as popular and it hasn't gotten as much traction as was expected. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, that's not surprising because, you know, you already have, uh, you know, the likes of Alipay and WeChat uh, filling in for that role in that particular country. And in the developed world and even in developing countries, uh, the introduction of retail CBDCs leads to, uh, you know, important and difficult questions about privacy and anonymity. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to get to privacy in just a minute. I know that's a topic that's near and dear to your heart. But before we do that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the countries you mentioned. China, we've heard a lot about the Juan, perhaps um, taking a leadership role. Um, there's the, uh, I've read a lot about the BRIC countries and a currency coming out of the BRIC countries. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that or what's your take on those currencies potentially taking a leading role? Well, I have discussed this and commented on this uh, publicly. And let me tell you that a BRIC currency at this point is a bit of a non-starter. So let me start with the status of the BRIC itself. More and more countries want to jump onto the BRIC bandwagon for reasons of their own. So, you know, you might have to find a new name for itself. I'm not running it down. It's an important agglomeration of countries. But at the same time, the BRIC itself is terribly lopsided. Uh, you know, any currency born out of a basket of currencies which make up, uh, you know, the currencies of the big countries will be dominated overwhelmingly by the by the digital yuan uh, and definitely will, uh, you know, uh, satisfy China's ambitions of internationalizing its currency. But at the same time, will other countries agree? Uh, India and China, for example, have fairly prickly relations, uh, whereas China's relations with other countries are perhaps better. So that's a bit of a non-starter, uh, even though, you know, the Brazilian president has gone on record discussing the need for a BRICS currency. So what is likely to happen is a diversification away from the US dollar to a basket of currencies. And what is that basket going to look like? So it's going to be the euro, the won, and several other allied currencies. So essentially, the gap between the US dollar and other currencies uh, sort of declines to a certain extent, but the US dollar overwhelmingly dominates uh, you know as a share of foreign trade over the foreseeable future which is what which is the next five years for instance gotcha thank you for those for those views very interesting and i do want to dig a little deeper now into the potential impacts of digital currencies specifically how privacy and anonymity will be affected um what's the potential fallout from where you sit and how does that vary by various you know parts of the planet geopolitical realities etc so before we start this very important bit of this discussion, uh, I'd like to try and define those terms, privacy and anonymity. 
Privacy is something that even the UN has guaranteed as a right. Essentially, it means that you keep your data safe and secure and you ensure that only those whom you provide specific rights to have the right to view that data. So, for example, iMessage for long and still now has encrypted messaging. And when you send an iMessage to another person, say me, for instance, you would expect that only I would read that particular message and not any other person in your address book. So that's privacy. Anonymity is a slightly more controversial concept. So anonymity means that you have a fake handle or you use an anonymous handle. Let me be very clear, not a fake handle, but an anonymous handle on a specific social media service. So in this case, your identity remains secret, but your activities may or may not remain secret. So anonymity, in fact, is a more, uh, more sort of extreme form of privacy. And it's absolutely impossible to guarantee in a digitalized world. And the reason for that is any form of digital payment, whether it's a real time payment service run by an institution backed by the government, or it's Venmo or it's Apple Pay inherently leaves a trail, an auditable trail of transactions, and not just a trail of transactions, but it also uh, discloses interesting nuggets about your spending behavior and your life in general. Uh, that is something, you know, complete anonymity in digital transactions is something that only cash can guarantee. But cash, as you know, it's on its way out. And because of the capability of digital payments to generate this auditable trail, there are significant privacy concerns. So uh, that is one aspect of it. And, you know, you might argue that, look, this is exactly why uh, the proponents of cryptocurrency came up with Bitcoin, right? Because in this case, uh, not only are you know you as a user uh, anonymous, your transactions are also perhaps anonymous. Yes, you can track that in the case of malfeasance. Some protocols have now evolved, but uh, you know the sender and receiver of those transactions remain inherently inherently anonymous. Uh, well, I would argue actually that that's not anonymity, but pseudo anonymity, because the entire uh, you know distributed ledger can be viewed. Uh, especially by the th concerned authorities, they reveal several identifiers which are, you know, about us. So, for example, our age, our gender, our race, and our location uh, even can be tracked. And you can tie that together and then get a fair idea about, uh, you know, whether Joe or Swarup were using a particular distributed ledger chain to engage in transactions. So, to round up, you know, what I'm trying to say here, uh, the demise of cash has finally ended a completely anonymous form of transacting value. Uh, you know, so money or hard cash was the only completely anonymous way of, you know, storing value over time and exchange. Uh, digital payments has ended that, which has led to multiple concerns around privacy, who owns the data, who shares the data, who has rights to the data, and which authorities can gain access to which part of the data. Yeah, interesting. You touched on a lot there. And I think one of the things that worries people a lot about um, a, a new world of digital currency uh, is the potential for fraud, crime, you know, money laundering, and probably some other things that I'm not even aware of in this new, uh, potentially unregulated future. Um, so how concerned should we be about that? And what can companies or, or countries do to protect people and data? I think those concerns that you've raised, Joe, are extremely pertinent. And as uh, you know, monetary payment chains become increasingly digitalized, digital financial crime, the occurrence of those activities just go up, which leads also to strict anti-money laundering regulations. Many of whom are now, you know, internationally prescribed to, you know, for various agencies. They need to follow them. This is exactly why the proponents of CBDCs or authorities who wish to issue CBDCs argue that if you backed the issuance of CBDCs, you would enable us to crack down on anti on money laundering activities, on financial crime of various kinds, and illegal transactions. Uh, however, again, you know, we circle back to those privacy concerns, especially in countries where there are there is greater awareness of one's digital rights. So it's a bit of a, you know, a chicken and egg situation. Uh, how do you guarantee at least a minimum or a maximum modicum of privacy rights. Uh, I would argue that, you know, the US, for example, or any other developed country could actually take the lead on this by saying that, look, my CBDC is more private than yours. Uh, and because it offers a greater level of privacy, uh, to the extent of offering a level of pseudo anonymity, 
uh, you know, you could just continue to flock into the US dollar. Swarp, thank you so much for your time today. You've been very generous with your time. I have just one more question. Um, if I asked you to look out to 2030 or, or even 2035, um, how do you see all this playing out? I mean, ultimately, what do you see as the financial future and, and it will, will it be a good place where we like it or will we long for the, the good old days of the, the 2020s? Well, uh, you definitely will long for the good old days of the 2010s and 20s because as I've said, cash will probably decline to 5% of all transactions globally. But let me just bring in uh, you know, something which has become a bit of a watchword recently, which is AI. You will definitely see AI figure more on both the supply and demand side of money. Uh, you know, you will have more and more people using AI as a marketing tool, including to market financial services. At the same time, you will have AI enabled tools, both generative and predictive, uh, managing a lot of your monetary activity. So some of the things that we are now trying to achieve or striving to achieve in various parts of the globe, people will just take as given automation, instant, seamless cross-border payments, uh, very efficient at very low transaction costs. And of course, assisted by AI, which means that it takes out a lot of the drudgery related to, you know, both financial planning and transactions. Swarup, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate the conversation. Fascinating. Thanks, Joe. And thank you for listening to the Vision by Protivity podcast. Please rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to visit vision.protivity.com to view all of our latest content. Until next time, I'm Joe Kornick.